I live in a city, but I was recently in the Canadian Rockies. Now, while I was there, I drove a few miles out of town and parked near a small lake. Got out of the car, and it struck me that it was perfectly quiet. No sounds, no birds, no wind, not even the rippling of the water on the lake. And I was pretty unused to that. It's true. There are very few places in the United States, in the world, that are as quiet as that mountain lake that you were standing by. We don't realize how much we have filled our environment with sound. Because the soundscape my ears are used to is a little more tumultuous. I'm Seth Shostak, and this is Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. And I'm Molly Bentley. Can you hear me? No, because there's too much noise. Well, you're not going deaf, although you may be going deaf, but you're not imagining that the world is getting louder. And this excess racket is more than a nuisance. Noise pollution is becoming a growing health problem. Has it affected your ears? Well, the answer might surprise you. So uh, what do we do about it? Well, one team of scientists has set up microphones to identify what's making the loudest racket in one of America's bigger cities. But is obnoxious noise always a bad thing? Well, find out what creatures depend on having the loudest pipes around. You need to speak up over those beans, the human beans and the coffee beans. If, if you can hear those beans, Molly, I'm, I'm really impressed. I'm <laughs> but whatever you do, stay tuned. It's the ears have it. You know it when you're no longer standing next to a placid mountain lake. That cacophonous, urban banging, clanging, clattering, and shattering. No, oh, why, that's the sound of human progress. The first uh, sufferers of occupational hearing loss were people who pounded on metal, the tinsmiths and you know, sword makers and ringers of church bells. There's a, a particular kind of hearing loss that's referred to as a boiler maker's notch, because it dates back to the time of people building boilers. They had to be riveted together. People had to crouch inside these tanks to stabilize the other side of a rivet while somebody on the outside was pounding on it with a hammer. So it was like being in this iron echo chamber with this extraordinarily loud sound, hours at a time, and they all lost hearing. Now entire cities sound like boilermaker factories, what with the wailing and screeching of the machines in our lives. In New York City, for example, the biggest civic complaint? No, it's not slow walkers, it's noise. Walking around New York City now, I am really aware there are a lot of trucks in the city. I hear the subway. Beneath my feet. And the noisiest city in the U.S. is also one of the busiest, which means that if your only available delivery window is 2 a.m., well, you're going to grab it. You get these big trucks driving into somewhere like the Lower East Side. Where people live on the second floor, you know, you've got people within feet of the refrigeration units on top of trucks. And the trucks are going to park up and they're going to run uh, and they're also going to be unloading. So you get those big kind of cage things that are rolled out. And that's a big issue because that happens late at night generally. Oh my gosh, I was hoping to sleep another couple of hours. <laughs> well, no wonder it's a city that never sleeps. We will find out what noise is doing to your hearing later. But to make an inventory of the biggest noise offenders in their city, New York University scientists have deployed audio sensors around a few key spots in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Making a large-scale sound map of their city is the aim of the multi-year Sounds of New York City project, S-O-N-Y-C, Sonic. It's about tackling noise as opposed to sound. You know, we don't want to quieten the city down. It's more to kind of bring down the noise that maybe doesn't have to happen so often. Research assistant professors Charlie Midlarts and Mark Cartwright and their team have already collected millions of audio snippets, only a fraction of which have been identified. But others are lending their ears to the project, both members of the public and artificial intelligence in the form of machine learning. They're both working to categorize the sounds. 
Now, noise is frequently characterized by its decibel level. That's an engineering term. It's a relative scale, and it's logarithmic. So if you say some noise source is at a level of 80 decibels and another at 10 decibels, well, it's not that the first is eight times stronger than the second. It's 10 million times stronger. Your garbage disposal has a level of about 80 decibels, and soft breathing has a decibel level of maybe 10. And the streets of New York, well, they'd be somewhere between 70 and 80 decibels. The project's aim, eventually, is that the system will automatically ID the sources of noise pollution in those snippets and flag them for mitigation by the local Department of Environmental Protection, or DEP. If Sonic works out, something like it might be the ears of your noisy city one day. But the first step, says Dr. Midlarts, is to answer the question, what was that noise? We wanted to build a network that had a bunch of features, right? The first, uh, the sensors. Well, when you say sensor, are we talking just a microphone? Did you d just set up a thousand microphones all over New York City? The microphone is the core part, right? That's our kind of, that's our ear in, into the world. That's our main sensor. But it, it, essentially, it's a microphone connected to a small single board computer. Uh, so we have a fair amount of processing power. So help us all picture these sensors. Are they up on light poles? Are they on top of buildings? And then the big question, how do you keep the pigeons from sitting on them? Well, <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty nondescript. It looks very much like a microphone. And then it's got this gray box. It looks a very kind of nondescript thing. And we, we have them mounted to light poles. Window ledges is the main place we mount them. And it's true. Yeah, pigeons are, like to sit on these things and they like to peck at the microphone windshield. Do you have the sound of pigeons pecking on the microphone? It's, it's not one of our <laughs> classes, but I'm sure we would hear it if, if we looked for it. You can imagine the sound of a pigeon pecking a microphone. It's going to be just little bumps. Okay. So we do actually have spikes. We have pigeon spikes. Oh, that was a much more interesting answer than, than I predicted. So, so there are some pigeon interference here. But otherwise, um, this project is, has gone uninterrupted for a couple of years. You've been recording the sounds. They're quite <clears throat> abbreviated snippets that you're recording, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the concerns about privacy. We have a number of precautions uh, in our recordings. So for one, the sensors are usually located around 20 feet up. You can't hear a conversation. So even if you hear a few words, if someone's talking really loudly and it's quiet around them, because we only collect 10 second snippets at a time, it's not a discernible conversation. What triggers the recording and what stops it? It's random. It's random. Mm -hmm. We also have collected over like 150 million of these things so far. So 150 million snippets? Uh, yep. 150 million 10 second snippets. Among the places that you are monitoring, what has emerged as one of the, the loudest? It's going to be construction related. I mean, that is. Anywhere. For sounds that are not enforceable by the DEP, you're talking sirens. I mean, that's a pretty noisy source. Tall vehicles, uh, the sirens are obviously designed to be loud and discernible from across many blocks. So, of course, that's, that's loud. Pile driver will be hitting in excess of 100 decibels. One of, one of the things with Manhattan, for example, is they have this bedrock underneath Manhattan. It allows them to build the building so tall, this incredibly dense bedrock, uh, and they have to smash that bedrock out to dig out foundations. And these pile drivers, which are basically just big weights that keep dropping repeatedly to kind of tunnel down and bore down to, to dig these foundations, that's loud. And that sound, that bang, 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 is going to annoy anyone. And especially when every bang is around 100 decibels, that's really going to travel. So that's some of the loudest. Um, give us a range, Mark, of some of the, the decibel levels. <laughs> You're pointing to, to Charlie. He's a decibel <laughs> master. He's, what are we talking about in terms of range here? Really, what we're interested in is the high end, the, the end that is potentially quite harmful. On the streets, you're going to be hit with... 70, 80, 90 to 100, the subway is really noisy. You can be getting over 100 decibels from the, the squeak of the wheels, like the brakes kicking in. Walking past a construction site, 90s, over 100 if they're doing big work. So, Mark, this is a citizen science project. You've asked the public for help in identifying some of these sounds. Why did you enlist the public's help? Yeah, so in order to train machines to identify these sounds, we need some labeled data for the machines to know what sounds are present in their training examples. So in order to get that labeled data, we created a task on Zooniverse, which is the largest citizen science platform online, and recruited volunteers through that to, to listen and annotate some of our recordings 
which we can then use to train our machine listening models. So if you get a construction worker participating, that person might be able to identify. They would be fantastic. They would be the different yeah. sounds. They would love them because they 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 just they would know the difference between a rock drill and a jackhammer. That's yes. difficult. That's, That's a hard really one. tricky. Yeah. Isn't a jackhammer a kind of rock drill? Uh, a jackhammer is like, it's the big one, you know, I mean, yeah, everyone I know. knows what a jackhammer is. A rock drill is kind of like an impact drill. So it's kind of jackhammering, but spinning as well. It's kind <laughs> of at a faster rate than a, than a jackhammer. It's got a kind of a yeah. higher pitch almost versus like a jackhammer, which is thud, thud, thud. What is the role of AI in all of this? Right. So as I said, we've collected 150 million of these little 10 second snippets and it's not really feasible for us to have someone listening to these microphones all the time, right? So we need to use machine learning to do that. So you give it the sound of, say, a car horn over and over or a jackhammer mm-hmm. over and over, and then it's able to identify those sounds? Yeah, so that's one form of machine learning. But um, it has to do that from the cacophony of sounds. So it's not mm-hmm. as though any one of these sounds in New York is isolated you might have the layers of people talking and the trucks and the jackhammers and that weird sound that happened around the corner somewhere. What was that? We're teaching our models to identify those sources simultaneously. So it'll, it'll, it'll say whether there's a jackhammer and a siren at the same time, for instance. And, and how do they do that? How, how are the machines able to differentiate these sounds if they're all happening together? I mean, I tried this um, mm-hmm. project because anyone can go on and go to your website and try to identify some of these sounds. And you have a number of categories and everything that I listened to fell under the category for me, this is what I selected, of mm-hmm. other slash unknown impact machinery. <laughs> it all just sounded like machines. So the first step in in most machine listening models is taking small windows of time and transforming uh, that um, time domain waveform and looking at the frequency content of that. So if you give it, give it enough examples of these different types of sounds in different conditions, we can teach machines to recognize the presence of these different sounds. Because it's going to be getting like sirens, for example, siren at 10 blocks distance, siren at one block, uh, siren going past the mic in a certain way, siren blocked by a truck. There's so many variations of a siren that you could experience in the city that the machine has to, I mean, in in the ideal world, it's here's every example of every siren ever. But in reality, obviously, we're limited. Well, finally, uh, how will the lives of New Yorkers change? What is the optimistic vision that you have for your project? One of the long-term goals of Sonic is to ultimately improve quality of life for New York City residents just through uh, more effective noise enforcement in the city. So we, we, we don't enforce the noise code, but the people who do, we hope to give them data and tools in order to better use their resources for mitigation. We're trying to kind of figure out how to do this sort of stuff. And one hope from this project would be that we're we're building tools and processes then other people could take and adopt and scale for their own cities in, in the long term through this this kind of research we can try and bring about uh, self-regulation so if you can kind of raise awareness of a noise controller's footprint a noise controller might be a construction site manager if they can be made more aware of their noise footprint then maybe in the long term, they will start to consider the noise impact that they have on surrounding residents. So if we can bring down the noise and allow someone to sleep a few more hours a night, that's like one step. So, you know, if, and if you can roll that out and uh, raise awareness for all of these noise controllers, these noise managers, if you like, then, you know, that could eventually result in improved quality of life. Great. So maybe the city that never sleeps will become the city that now is able to get some sleep. To get some sleep. But also, if you don't want to have some sleep, you could still go out. But then, you know, (laughs) you're guaranteed a good night's sleep if you want it. Charlie Midlarts and Mark Cartwright, thank you very much for talking to us. You're welcome. Thank you. It's been fun. Mark Cartwright and Charlie Midlarts are both research assistant professors at New York University. And you can read more about the Sounds of New York City project, or SONIC, on our website, bigpicturescience.org. Excess noise is more than a nuisance. It can create health problems. Young people tend to think, you know, hearing problems, those are problems of old people. They are problems of old people, but they're problems of old people caused by things that those old people did when they were young. Next, never mind about rock concerts. What's the roar of your blender doing to your ears? Want to know more? Hi? Nay? 
Well, it sounds as if the ears have it on Big Picture Science. My name is Margaret Atwood. This is Martin Amis. Lydia Yuknovich. Tommy Orange. I'm Werner Herzog. And this is Bookmarks, a new weekly micro-podcast where writers recommend a book they love. This is Anne Lamott. A book that changed my life forever was Pippi Longstockings. I was eating a donut, and I just realized what a novel could do for the first time. Bookmarks from To the Best of Our Knowledge. Look for them wherever you podcast. More at ttbook.org slash bookmarks. We're talking about noise on Big Picture Science, and now the consequence of exposing your ears to too much of it. While New Yorker staff writer David Owen is most familiar with the din of his own city, ear-splitting urbanism is not restricted to Manhattan. Noise pollution is among the top global environmental risks to health. When the World Health Organization says that pollution kills... It's not always referring to dirty air. Excess noise interferes with work, school, and sleep. It can put a stress on your cardiovascular system, and it can devastate ecosystems. Concerned about his own hearing led David Owen to do some research into how our ears are absorbing and coping with an increasingly louder world. His book, Volume Control, Hearing in a Deafening World. David, have you noticed any loss of hearing for yourself? I mean, is this a a problem you you you've contracted? I have a small amount of hearing loss, pretty typical for somebody my age. I'm in my 60s. I also have this condition called tinnitus or tinnitus. It's a constant ringing in my ears. I can hear it all the time. I can hear it right now. And maybe you could describe for those who don't have an experience yet with yet, I say yet, uh, with tinnitus, uh, you know what it's like. What are the symptoms? What do you hear? It's different for different people. For me, it's a very high-pitched sound. It sounds if you have uh, halogen lights in the on a dimmer in a ceiling and they make a whining sound, it kind of sounds like that. So, and it's it's there all the time. Unfortunately, there's no known cure for it. The standard treatment for it is to learn to ignore it, which is what I've actually been pretty good at. Now, hearing loss, you have already mentioned that hearing loss is a common accompaniment of getting older, just like, you know, uh, your knees aren't quite what they were when you were younger and so forth. You know, do you have any idea what fraction of the population, say, over the age of 60, uh, suffers from hearing loss? Uh, it's very high. People give percentages, and I think that the real percentage is higher. At a certain point, it's probably just about everybody has some degree of hearing loss. Whether it's a debilitating level or not is different. There's also some question as to whether it's caused by aging or simply accompanies aging. There have been a couple of studies done with indigenous populations of people in places where they basically are, have never been exposed to the sound of modern life. And those people in their, in their 70s have a hearing like the hearing of newborns. They, it's unimpaired. So it's not necessarily aging that causes our ears to get worse. It's probably a lifetime of uh, accumulated damage that we do by exposing ourselves to excessively loud sound. Well, you live in a relatively quiet part of the country now, but, you know, I have never adjusted where I live to accommodate a quieter environment. Maybe you could give me some examples of the sorts of everyday sounds that could be affecting our hearing. Uh, this time of year, I think gasoline-powered leaf blowers with those uh, incredibly annoying. It's a sound that begins, you know, as soon as the first leaf falls and continues until the ground is covered with snow, and then it picks up again in the spring. It's become the kind of background sound of, of suburbia. The sound of traffic, the sound of airplanes. Anybody who lives in a city, the sound levels are incredibly high. Scientists are beginning to believe that, that we can do permanent damage to our hearing with much briefer exposures. It used to be said, you know, you can be exposed for hours at this level. Now it's, it seems clear that briefer exposures to lower decibel levels can do permanent damage. It's not entirely clear yet what those are. It's in surprising places, too. It's easy to think of uh, heavy metal rock as being damaging to people's ears. But, you know, symphony orchestras, violinists tend to lose hearing on their left, the ear that's most exposed to their instrument. And the threat that they face is not just from their own instrument, but also depends on who sits behind them in the orchestra. So if you've got a, a French horn player sitting right behind you, you can be exposed to very loud, damaging sound that you're not even producing yourself. 
Uh, what about other critters? I mean, we've been talking about, of course, human hearing loss, but what, what about animals that are not humans, which is to say essentially all of them? Do they suffer from hearing loss caused by any of the mo- uh, noise that either we're making or that exists in their own environments? They do. And human-generated sound it has a major impact on wildlife on land, in the air, under the sea. When we see beached whales, whales that have come up and and thrown themselves on a beach and they can't get back in the water, often it turns out that they have damaged themselves, in some cases by being startled by human-generated sounds, by sonar, for example. When they're grazing deep underwater, they bolt toward the surface. They suffer the bends, uh, which I had always thought was something that was a threat to to humans and not to marine mammals. Or their ears are simply deafened by human-generated sound underwater. The effects are above in the air as well. Animals that depend on hearing to hunt. There's prey that depends on hearing to defend themselves from predators. And so when we introduce huge levels of uh, human-generated background noise into those environments, uh, we throw that completely out of kilter. And animals, they have to either adjust or perish. Tell us a little bit about the physiology of hearing loss. You know, what, what gets damaged inside your ear? It's amazing. I didn't really even understand what sound is when I started. And it's these vibrations, it's little pulses of air pressure. Our eardrums are capable of being moved by these tiny, tiny, immeasurably small vibrations, fluctuations in air pressure. Those vibrations are transmitted across three tiny little connected bones inside the middle ear and into the inner ear, which is the size of a little bit larger than a miniature chocolate chip. It's this little BB-sized receptor inside the head. And we turn that, these vibrations from the outside world into what we call sound and to intelligible sound. It's not just that you hear a, you know, a thumping from outside. You can understand what I'm saying while we're talking. I can hear other things. You know, I can, when I was working on the book, I said, you know, I can, I can hear my keyboard. I can hear my wife talking on the phone around a corner. I can hear the furnace that just came on and I can distinguish all of these sounds. It's beyond remarkable. One difference between hearing and other senses is, you know, your, your, your tongue is constantly regenerating taste buds. You're shedding and regenerating taste buds. That does not happen inside the ear. The receptor cells that you were born with are the only ones you get through your whole lifetime. They have to last your whole life. And once we lose them, we don't get them back. So it's worth protecting them. Even, you know, what might seem initially like extreme steps. I mean, I used to laugh at my wife because she would put on earplugs when she used her food processor. But now I do the same thing. We should all do it. Well, well okay. That suggests an obvious research interest. Uh, namely, is there any way to regenerate, uh, I don't know, the cilia of the inner ear, or whatever it is that's getting damaged by this uh, repeated exposure to loud sounds? I mean, is there no hope here other than buying a hearing aid? There are researchers all over the country who are working on the possibility of regenerating lost hearing. But it's complicated because you not only have to replicate damaged cells, you have to replicate them in ways where they plug in exactly into this complex apparatus that's frequency tuned where every part plays a specific role. And it's not just enough to randomly generate new cells. They have to be new cells of the right type in the right place. It's a challenge, but there are a lot of people working on it. It seems that the World Health Organization has actually made noise maps of cities. And there's a claim, perhaps you can corroborate whether it's a a legitimate claim, that traffic noise correlates with a reduced lifespan and even with ailments such as heart disease. No, it's true. I visited a non-government organization in Paris that monitors sound levels in metropolitan Paris. And they had produced maps and then had kind of superimposed World Health Organization data and showed that people who lived in high traffic quarters, near highways, next to train tracks, under flight paths, had reduced life expectancies, had increased incidence of things like heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure, low birth weight in newborn children, concentration problems at work and at school, uh, learning difficulties, difficulty sleeping, all of these consequences of exposure to high levels of sound. There was an interesting study done in New York in the 1970s of an elementary school in way northern Manhattan at Inwood, about 200 feet from an elevated train track. And the train, when it went by, was so loud that the teacher, about every four or five minutes, had to stop teaching for half a minute. And then she had to regain the concentration of her students. And what they determined was that after this 
elementary school's worth of exposure to the sound that the classes on the train side of the building were a full year behind in, in reading comprehension, a full year behind the students on the quieter side of the building. Yeah, that's very significant. I mean, that begs the question, so what do we do about that sort of thing? I mean, can we just better sound insulate our environment, our interior environments? They were actually able to do that. They put some rubber pads between the, the rails and the ties on the train. They put some acoustic tiles in the classrooms. They made a, a number of modifications. And in fact, they were able to then prove that the students on the what had been the loud side of the building caught up. The disparity disappeared. So there are things that we can do. David Owen, thanks so very much for letting us speak to you and allowing us to hear you. Thank you. David Owen is a staff writer for The New Yorker and the author of Volume Control, Hearing in a Deafening World. Well, it's concerning, isn't it, Seth, what we're doing to our ears? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of depressing to hear now that if I'd only been a little more circumspect when I was younger about those loud noises I was exposed to, you know, I might avoid uh, the... what seems inevitable hearing loss. You know what else struck me about your conversation with David Owen? That we should be wearing earplugs when we run the blender. I know. Well, that, you know, normally I run the blender in pulse mode, so it's just a few... (laughs) You know, a second or two. So that's going to be frustrating. You have to put the earplugs in, take them out, put them in, take them out as you pulse. Well, maybe you should just use them all the time you're in the kitchen. I, I never thought of the kitchen as being dangerous because of the noise. While humans' mental and physical health suffer because of a self-created world of industrial din, some creatures have evolved to be, and thrive as, powerful noisemakers. But there's one animal that is reputedly said to be louder than all the other members of its ilk, and recently a team of bioacousticians set out to find it. They were not so much on a trip as on an expedition. So this research took place at the northern end of the Brazilian Amazon forest. You may think of the Amazon as languid lowland, and indeed most of it is at sea level or a little bit higher. But there are mountains in the Amazon too, and reaching the top of one of them required more than a week's climb. And so we hired a team of local Brazilians to help us clearing trails with machetes. And so as we're climbing up the mountain, we're hearing the animals that we came to study, but we can't quite see them yet. And it takes hours and hours, and finally we get up to the top at about a kilometer altitude, and we found what we were looking for. The scientists were, we can say, speechless, standing before a dove-sized bird sitting in a tree. It's beautiful. You see it typically against the contrast of a blue sky or against a green forest, and the white really stands out. And it is also characterized by this really funky waddle that hangs from its beak. It looks like a worm or the tail of a lizard. And as the bird's kind of uh, nervous and Ellie, it hops around on the perch a little bit. And you can tell when he's gearing up to sing because he kind of stops, he seems to focus, and he starts gulping in air. And he actually <laughs> opens up his beak fairly widely even before he starts to sing. My name is Jeff Potos, and I am a professor at UMass Amherst, and I study bird communication. We've had to attenuate the sound of the bird because of the dynamic range limitations of radio. But try to imagine just how much louder this would have been in the Amazon jungle. Thousands of times louder, actually. There are also howler monkeys there, and howler monkeys are incredibly loud. (coughs) Although apparently not as loud as these bellbirds. The bellbirds are louder than the howler monkeys? Yeah. Although some ornithologists had believed the Amazon bellbird might break avian vocal records, no one, until now, had actually measured its loudness. Dr. Podos and his Brazilian colleague Mario Cohenhoft brought recorders and sound level meters. These are instruments that measure sound pressure. They wanted to know whether this small bird did break all records. And they wanted to contribute to a larger effort to understand and catalog the diversity of species in the remote Amazon. Now scientists say they have a winner, the loudest bird calls ever measured. The white bellbird sings two main types of songs, at least at the, in the population that we were studying. The more common song type comes in and registers at about 
um, I think 111 decibels at an average level, and at peak levels, it's reaching about 116 decibels. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's in that ballpark. They have a rarer song type we call type 2 that registers in at average levels at about 117 decibels, and it peaks at around 125 decibels. The bellbird's about as loud as a jackhammer, um, a little bit louder, and at the peaks, it's as loud as a pile driver. Okay, so we're about to hear a clip. This was recorded by my collaborator, Mario, and he was focused on a male bellbird that was in the middle of a bout of singing. I think in the foreground, you'll hear some other birds singing. There are these small little twittery birds called euphonias, brightly colored, and they're singing their songs. And that actually sets a nice contrast to the booming voice of the white bellbird that follows. And it's really loud, but it's not as loud as the other type song. Okay, so next we're gonna hear a song, a, a rendition of the type two song, and this is the one that's really loud. This is the one that peaks at 125 decibels or so. And structurally, you can hear it's slightly different than the other song. Well, Jeff, my first thought, it sounds like something you might hear on a train platform. There's kind of an electronics uh, sound to it. I, I totally agree. And when we hear that in the field, it doesn't sound like a normal sort of bird song. Somebody commented that it sounds kind of like the starting signal for a swim race, the swim heat. <laughs> Well, most of the time we don't see the females. <laughs> no surprise, right? <laughs> well, it's true for a lot of these birds. Females seem to be more sensible, generally. They are colored more of a, a greenish yellow with some modeling. So they're actually physically harder to see. However, sometimes they will emerge from the canopy and sidle up to the males as they're singing. And, and the males notice this immediately. You refer to this sound that we just heard, this noisemaker, as um, as singing, as a bird singing. But it doesn't really sound like singing uh, because it's not a continual melody. It is just like a foghorn, but you call it singing. Well, songs have a lot of different traits that you can talk about. So there's the rhythms, the timing. There's the pitch changes, the frequency. There's the loudness, the amplitude. And we think that's what's going on with these bellbirds is that for some reason, females of these species are just really interested in loud songs. And so early in evolution, I am pretty sure that bellbird songs would have been more typical of the of normal songs. But as they started to evolve to be louder and louder, I think that the rest of the features that would complicate the birds' abilities to get to really loud songs began to be stripped away. And so, for example, if you want to be really loud, it's better not to have multiple notes like those euphonias. It's better just to put all your energy into one note. And it's better not to do dipsy doos in the frequency register. Just focus on one individual note. And so structurally, they came up with these sounds that are single, unmodulated in terms of frequency, and really loud. Now I have to ask, can you do a vocal dipsy do with your voice right now? <laughs> Um, I'm not the right person to do that, but my co-author would be, uh, Mario would be very happy to, to oblige you on that. But he's, he's, not he's a great us. singer. He's not, he's with, not with us at this moment. So what does a dipsy do? Like up and down and up and down like that? Yeah, just like you did. That's a great example. <laughs> I can't believe you weren't willing to do that. No, okay. But in all seriousness, the, the, the females, we said that their females are nowhere to be seen. But as you said, they, they occasionally do... Uh, sit on the branch uh, along with this male. And is the male screaming in her face? So this is something that, that we kind of knew about. We had read about it, but to have seen it, it was just thrilling. So um, there's a very specific choreographed interaction that happens as the females show up on the perch. So the females show up and the males clearly seem to get excited about this. The first thing they do is they swivel so as to keep their back towards the female. Um, so they, they lower their tail and they lower their head. They make sort of this inverted U shape. And that, that waddle of theirs is dangling pretty low. And the female seems to be interested. She's checking them out visually. And then if she is interested, she will get closer to the male. And as she moves getting closer to the male, he maintains his orientation so that his back is towards her. And then when she's right next to him, he starts to gulp in air and he opens up his beak and you can tell he's about to sing and the female can tell and it's reaching this really intense moment. And then he starts to sing and what he does is he sings only the louder of those two song types. So he chooses to 
to, to sing his loudest song at close range like this. And what he does is he sings the first note facing away from her in this orientation, and then he swivels around, and it's very theatrical, to sing the second note right in the space where the female would have been had she stayed. As you describe that, it's sounding like the unfolding of an opera. I can imagine these characters on stage, very dramatic, singing and speaking with your back to your beloved and then turning around suddenly. <laughs> exactly. It seems to um, accentuate the loudness of the sound. If the first note's away and then the bird swivels around and it, it provides a contrast. And it just seems like another of the male's tricks to try to impress the female. Well, finally, Jeff, the world itself is getting louder. And I wonder if birds in general are adapting to the sounds around us, most produced by humans and their machines, by becoming louder. And will the bellbird have to do that as well and become even louder than he is now? Well, that's an interesting question. So there are a lot of studies out there that are tracking birds that live in more uh, urban environments and comparing those songs of, the, of those birds to other populations in more conserved environments, softer, quieter environments. And there is some growing evidence that across a lot of different species, the birds are facing greater challenges in acoustic communication because of human noise. And how that plays out depends on the species. So there are some species that just give up and they just stop breeding. They, they leave and go to other places. So there are some species you just don't find near human habitation. And it could just be because of masking of their noise, of their songs. There are other species that seem to either adjust their songs or switch to song types they're already singing that are will either allow them to sing more loudly or to sing at pitches that are not masked by the lower frequency noises from human machines and so forth. Um, as for the bellbirds, they're safe so far at the tops of mountains. I don't think anyone's going to get up there with, with any machinery of any kind fairly soon. Well, Jeff Potos, thank you so much for taking the time, and not yell at us, but to speak to us in very calming tones about the lovely white bellbird. Well, thank you so much, Molly. I appreciate the invitation, and I'm happy to talk softly about loud birds. Jeff Potos is a biologist at the University of Massachusetts Amherst who studies the vocal behavior and evolution of songbirds. Coming up, we heard earlier that excess noise can destroy marine ecosystems. But could this sound bring some of them back? And so by using sound, we're able to call these fish back into some of these habitats to start to recolonize, rebuild the community in a way that that reef can then recover. It's The Ears Have It on Big Picture Science. And by the way, if you have some thoughts about this show or other episodes you'd like to share, well, you can connect with us quietly on social media. We're on Twitter at PiPiSci. Marine biologist Steve Simpson has been going around studying and listening to coral reefs to piece together their soundscapes and identify the sounds that characterize healthy reefs. They're actually noisier than you think. Yeah, well, I mean, wasn't that just a fabulous recording? That was one that I took just bobbing off the edge of a reef in the Philippines. And it was the middle of the day, so you've got a lot of fish that are out, they're active, they're defending their territories, they're trying to impress each other, they might be warning each other of predators in the area. And so a lot of the sounds that you hear, the chirping, the croaking, the grunting sounds, are fish. And on coral reefs, you've got you know, hundreds of species of fish that can produce sound. And it's a really crucial part of their life to be able to listen to each other. But then in the background, you probably also noticed, I mean, it's almost the foreground, you can hear this crackling sound, constant crackling. That's the sound of snapping shrimp, which are small shrimps about the size of your thumb that have a claw tip that can fire a bubble forwards into the water. When it hits the pressure of the water, it implodes, creating a very loud, explosive sound. And when you put all the snapping shrimp together, you get that crackling sound.
A reef that is dying, however, or that is dead, is eerily silent. That silence now defines long stretches of the Great Barrier Reef due to the massive bleaching events caused by above-average ocean temperatures. Knowing how much important information for wildlife is packed into the sounds of a healthy reef, Dr. Simpson and his colleagues at the University of Exeter and in Australia wondered whether those sounds could lure life back to dead coral. The results of their study they published in Nature Communications, along with a description of their experiment using underwater speakers to play the sounds you heard of fish and snapping shrimp to dead patches of the Great Barrier Reef. Snapping shrimp often live in burrows, so they use their snaps as a way of communicating with each other, and that could be to uh, try and attract each other into the burrows when it's the breeding season. But many snapping shrimp then live in a partnership with a goby, a type of fish about the size of your finger, which has very good eyesight but nowhere to live. And the snapping shrimp is almost blind but is great at building tunnels. So the, the shrimp and goby live together and that snapping sound is a way that the shrimp can communicate with the goby when it's ready to come out and shovel all the sand back out of its tunnels. So it has a very uh, strategic value. I mean, it's, they're not doing it just for their amusement. No, no, no. And, and actually, I mean, it was really a, a mystery to science as to how they could produce such a loud bang. When you look at the intensity of the sound, they would shatter their claw if they actually snapped the claw shut to make such a loud noise. But what they realise is that the shrimp can open its claw at lightning speed, which creates a vacuum inside the claw, which then causes bubbles to form. And that bubble, when it's fired forwards, then it implodes and creates the loud bang. It even gives off a flash of light, gets up to several thousand degrees centigrade. So it really is one of the most incredible sonic weapons that you see in the animal kingdom. You know, it gives me a whole new uh, insight into <laughs> to shrimp. You, you also described that many of the sounds are caused by fish. That's remarkable. I, I, I have gone snorkeling. I don't hear fish. Yeah, well, so once you start listening, you will find on snorkel that you can hear fish. And in fact, when you dive under the water, you often end up with a bubble inside the middle of your ear, which blocks the sound from getting to your eardrum. If you stick your finger into your ear when you're underwater, suddenly your whole body is coupled to the water around you. And you start to really hear these different sounds of fish, particularly if you get too close to their territory, will come and start popping at you to chase you away. But the more we listen, the more we realise that fish have so many different ways of making these amazing sounds from simple pops through to some quite complex whooping sounds. The love song of the cod, which creates these incredible deep rumbling sounds, vibrating their swim bladder to create low frequency rumbling sounds. And they do this at the point that the male persuades a female in the middle of the night to swim up from deep water towards the surface. He's got about six or seven seconds to get his love song just right so that she releases hundreds of thousands of eggs for him to fertilize. So, you know, we realize that these sounds that they make are really critical to their survival, to their lives, and their ability to be able to breed into the next generation. Your intention here was to record the sounds, as you've done, from a healthy reef, and then to play them back in a less healthy reef, right? With the, the intention of maybe, I don't know, restoring the environment of a healthy reef and bringing the inhabitants and new inhabitants to that devastated reef. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's, so that's right. So we built about 33 reefs, and to some of those reefs we put underwater speakers. The speakers are generally sold for synchronized swimming teams to be able to keep beat underwater in the swimming pools. <laughs> but when we play our recordings of coral reefs, we can sonify an area of, of several meters around the reef that we've built. And we did this then through the summer season when larval fish are out in the plankton and are coming back to look for a reef to live in. And we monitored those reefs over a period of six weeks where we could then really watch the reef fish community start to rebuild. And what we found was that when we were playing the sounds of our healthy coral reefs around these degraded habitats, the fish would arrive, they would stay there. So we ended up with about 50% more fish and a doubling of the diversity of fish on those reefs. So it really was effective. Can, can you tell me why it is that the fish prefer to be somewhere where the sound environment is, if you will, more natural, at least uh, more healthy? I mean, what's in it for them? What, what are they, if you will, subconsciously thinking? I mean, that, that mm. this is safe from predators or there's food here or I can mate here. I mean, what, what is it that uh, 
they're looking for? So I think that's a really good question. I think that coral reef fish over evolutionary time have evolved the ability to use acoustic cues as a way of selecting habitat. So uh, the analogy we like to use is if you were moving to a new city, you'd probably go onto the internet and research different suburbs before you chose where to go and live. Fish, we think, can hear the communities on the potential sites that they might want to go and live in from tens, maybe hundreds of metres away. So they can remotely sample these different communities to work out where they'd like to go and live. And we think that the sounds of snapping shrimps, the sounds of some of the other invertebrates that you hear in the reef recordings, give the fish a good idea of where the complex coral reef habitat is that they would be able to then find as a, a safe place to settle. But if they can't hear the reef, then one of the most attractive cues that bring them into that habitat has gone. So advertising a better place to live, I don't know, will that bring the reef back to life if it's been devastated by these, if you will, environmental factors? I mean, does it really make a difference? Or do the fish just come in and they try and make a living in a poor neighborhood and don't do very well? So obviously what we don't want to do is to trick fish into habitat which is actually just not appropriate for them to be living in. When the fish come in, if uh, many of them are herbivores, they can start to clean the corals, they can give new corals spaces to grow, they can create light that allow the corals to thrive. Ultimately, these fish become prey to larger fish, so you'd start to rebuild the juvenile and adult parts of that um, fish community. And what we're now doing is working on much bigger restoration programs to look at whether soundscape enrichment can be used as a way of really accelerating the process of rebuilding a coral reef. Well, finally, Steve, I mean, this sounds very promising, but the Great Barrier Reef, I mean, it's not just a a two-mile-long thing. I mean, it goes on for like a (laughs) thousand miles or more, right? That's a lot of speakers, a lot of wire, (laughs) a lot of sound. I mean, is is this, you know, a practical, I I don't know, remedy for what's, what's befalling the reefs there in Australia? Yeah, I, I mean, clearly this isn't a silver bullet that will save the coral reefs of the world. Tragically, in my lifetime, we've lost a half of all the world's coral reefs. And what this really gives us is a sticking plaster, a Band-Aid for the problem. So what we're hoping that we can do by picking sites which are really likely to thrive if they're given a chance to recover, an opportunity to then become these havens of life which will gradually seed the other degraded habitats around them. All of that, of course, is completely meaningless if we don't actually manage to tackle the big crises that coral reefs are facing. So things like the warming seas, ocean acidification, and obviously overfishing. So, so long as those things are being addressed, then this really gives us a chance to accelerate and, and maximize the chance of recovery. Steve Simpson, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Steve Simpson is a professor of marine biology and global change at the University of Exeter. Well, in thinking about what the big picture is here, i got to say, sound is absolutely a wonderful sense. I mean, it's very sensitive to begin with. You can hear very, very faint stuff. And it's really useful if sight lines are short. You're in an environment like a forest where you can't see something. So, you know, when a tree falls in a forest, you can hear it even if the tree is half a mile away. So that's useful for survival. And what else has emerged is the difference between empty noise and meaningful sounds. So in the bird's mating call, the whale call, the chirps of the snapping shrimp, All of those sounds convey important messages that are needed for the survival of the species. But what is the message of a pile driver? There's no information in that other than there's some construction up the road. So really what's coming through is that the noise pollution of modern life has nothing to do with the natural acoustic soundscape. I mean, it's true. The animals don't have, you know, any formal languages, right? Birds don't speak very good French. But they certainly convey a lot with the sounds that they do make. In fact, you know, you think about it, most critters that make sounds, they're using them, as you say, for communication. Otherwise, they try and keep quiet because it's dangerous, right? You know, the cat walks across the uh, the grass there. It's pretty quiet about it. <laughs> so, yeah, information. That's what sound seems to be about if you're nature. But if you're a technological species like humans, well, you invent machines, and they are noisy. Well,
Well, thank you to those who help produce the sounds of this show every week. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff and assistant producer Sarah Derwin. I am executive producer Molly Bentley. And thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak, and I like snapping shrimp, especially when grilled. Also, big thanks to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called The Ears Have It. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and you'll also find links there to the guests you've heard. You may be listening to our radio show, but did you know you can also listen to BiPi Sci by subscribing to the BiPi Sci podcast, and you'll find links on our website to the platforms that carry us. Attentive Big Picture Science listeners may notice that Barbara Vance is missing from our end-of-show credits. Barbara, whose dedication, intelligence, and endless attention to detail has benefited our show ever since its inception, has decided to retire from the work world. Of course, we wish her well, but we will also miss her enormously. <laughs>